So if you click a few times anywhere in Philosophy YouTube, you'll probably see at least one Dark Academia cosplaying, glasses-wearing, long-haired, western logic pill doomer with a lot of big ideas and not a lot of substance behind them. POV, you were me a year ago and saw this video you thought might be interesting but turned out to be an apathy-peddling, reasoningly tenuous mess. No offense, of course. I watched it through and read the comments, which made my teeth lock up in the front of my mouth like I hadn't had my weekly tetanus shot. Oh my god, I'm 57 and sense of danger approaching like I'm a cliche M. Night or I. Night Shyamalan character. Oh my god, I'm 18 and solemnly, darkly, introspectively notice how people seem a bit more uncertain and insecure, etc. I'm not trying to make fun of people's real emotions they vent out via YouTube comment sections, not directly at least. But if you open up Twitter especially, or YouTube or Instagram or wherever, you'll see endless comments like these. Infinite mind-numbing apathy streaming from people's fingertips, and if you disagree, you're just naive. A naive and dumb person who isn't smart enough to perch on a chair and stare into the distance. It's boring. I'm bored. Hey guys, let's come up with something new to share with the masses. Something tangible that isn't just another reason we're all hurling towards something terrifying in the distance that no one really wants to define in a context that matches up to, well, reality. Mr. Steven Antonioni brings us yet another of these endless arguments telling us hope and future planning are pointless, actually. And as usual, his reasoning is essentially reason. In this video, I'll use my big black Occam's razor to cut through all this stuff and make some broader points about these never-ending doomer fallacies a lot of us tend to fall for, maybe out of genuine belief or because best girl Rei Ayanami really, really loves sulking depressed in the dark, just like you. Honestly, the question itself already seems really empty. Like, we need to ask other people to confirm that yes, our apathy is shared, yes, it's most people, yes, it's universal, probably. Opening the video, we start off with some background. When I was growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, everything felt different than it does today. Perhaps it was just the warm naivety of childhood, but I think it was actually something else. He pulls us in with the relatable naivety of youth, then suggests that naivety reflects something more sinister with the words something else. He wants us to remember that something else. The internet emerged and unleashed access to information upon the world. The middle class dream was alive and well. There was some level of faith, whether that be in our institutions, God, or ourselves. But in the 28 years that I've been alive, that warm naivety has turned into a cold lucidity. We get a transition here to really hammer in the apathy. The internet has exposed our dark side for all to see. The middle class dream has been pronounced dead. And I've been hard pressed to find a single soul who harbors any amount of faith that we are headed anywhere except in the wrong direction. What? I can let the middle class dream thing go, but the claim that almost all people living right now think the world's headed somewhere terrible forever is just genuinely insane? Think of all the people who go to parades, gaming YouTubers, building new channels, people who get married at 60. How can you say that hope is basically extinguished from the world without ignoring a good proportion, at worst a quarter to a half of the population? So far, this video tries to paint a pessimistic and individualist picture of the world, rather than a realistic one. It tries to make you feel apathy while simultaneously subliminal message spamming that everyone else feels it too. By playing into the vagueness of extremely general but absolute claims, it tries to convince you that things are uniquely different today than they were in the past. What is happening to us? And in getting you to answer this rhetorical question, it lets the personally supplied unnecessary words something bad hang in the air for most people who've watched this far. To be clear, obviously COVID and COVID countermeasures have kind of ripped community out from under millions of people, and certain wars or special military operations aren't making existence any less existentially worrying. The main problem I have here is that the argument in this video has nothing to do with any worrying predictions we may make about our current reality. Notice how the conclusion implied by the question What? is happening to us. Doesn't stem from any contextualized argument toward how COVID or new wars or Ubisoft prices or anything else will affect us in the future. It relies solely on the viewer's perception of the question itself, the viewer's own worries, prejudices, and existential dread alone. Steve the Sage then says that in order to answer the question of what is happening to us, we can look to three works of so-called brilliant thinkers. These particular works fit together like parts of a puzzle. A puzzle that if solved can tell us where we've been how we got here, and where we're headed. Sounds impressive, heady, and important. Notice how the finished puzzle is implied to be a pessimistic one, one that's predefined by galaxy brain yada based experts. Spoiler alert, these thinkers have written some whimsically mind-bending theories, but the reasoning doesn't really seem to connect to the premise here. The first work he introduces, or key one, is that of William Strauss and Neil Howe, the fourth turning. He explains that Strauss and Howe claim every 20 to 25 years there's one of four eras or turnings, as they call it, and that after the fourth turning, completing what they call a saculum, humanity will experience a crisis that enables the future to change its course. Okay, sure. If we look at all of history, I can imagine accepting that around every 70 to 80 years there appears to be a conflict between some number of groups, but firstly, what is it about a conflict that makes it mark the end of a saculum? How is the American Civil War, which happened only 
only in North America, considered a worldwide end to one of these secular. What about the Boxer Rebellion, or the Balkan or Rwanda genocides, or any other conflict or mass tragedy that happened between the start and end of one seculum? Second, and more importantly, even if these trends have existed in the past, what evidence is there that they'll continue into the future? The fact that we can point to world conflicts every so many years? If the glorious revolution in England ended a seculum, why is it that the influence of other cultures from across the globe hasn't messed with the next global crisis? I feel like this entire theory breaks down as soon as you try to imply it makes sense in the modern era. Who's to say that we don't have the ability to avoid a new descent into crisis? What is it about history that seems to apply so well to the abstracted future? Behind all these questions, it might sound like I'm trying to avoid addressing the issue here. Obviously, trends have existed in the past and may be likely to continue into the future. The problem, though, is that when we tell ourselves that no matter what, there's likely to be a crisis in five years, we end up presuming the reality of something that may have had no reason to exist in the first place. We then end up inadvertently contributing to a hypothetical crisis by telling ourselves before in the abstract that it exists. We end up preparing for a battle that we have no external reason to expect will come, and risk accidentally firing that first so-called defensive shot. Steve then ends up basically assuming this seculum theory is true. It's eerie. It's troubling to think that our lives might be bound to this cosmic wheel of sorts that predestines us to experience a calamity every 80 years or so. How do we explain this? I would suggest something a little more simple. Memory. You see, when I look back on the history of the time around the Great Depression or World War II, it appears more like a story to me than it does reality. History is an abstract notion. It feels like it's outside of ourselves because we did not actually experience it. So, I think if we're being honest with ourselves, the only ones who truly understand history are the ones who lived through it. And at this moment in time, someone who is about 20 years old today at the time of World War II would be somewhere around 100 years old today. I think that this is a particularly dangerous moment in time just because of the fact that most of the people who lived through the Great Depression or World War II are no longer with us today. This memory point isn't something I necessarily disagree with, but again, it's used to rhetorically motivate the same Doomer thesis as before. Of course, conflicts are by nature best understood by experience, but this says nothing about the human ability to learn from conflict and take unprecedented steps to ensure it never happens again. Calling our lack of experiential memory dangerous fails to account for how society has changed in the last 70 to 80 years, the new development into a trade or sanction-focused global economy, and the new standards of safety and political chess and common courtesy that exist in different parts of the world. Saying that we need memory to understand the true horror of a conflict itself not only ignores new technologies like TV or radio that can preserve the understanding of that horror into the modern era, but also ignores our potential to keep those warnings alive by teaching them in schools and keeping them part of the cultural zeitgeist. People in positions of power today have no real understanding of the darkness of these times. It's definitely possible that contemporary politicians are less tapped into the horror of conflict than they were before, but this in itself is nowhere near enough to justify the thought that a crisis will occur in five to ten years. Classic slippery slope fallacy stuff. However, this point is meant to connect to the main premise that the modern era feels off, it doesn't hold up well. Bye bye first theory. Next, Steve goes into key to Gnosis, from Václav Smil's How the World Really Works. He implies this refers to knowledge of an elevated degree and says, We can name Pete Davidson's last couple girlfriends, but we can't name the four most important materials that our world relies upon. Those being ammonia, plastics, steel, and cement. Yeah, I have no idea how this connects to the idea that something is off in modern society. Here he goes on to explain a sequence of facts that most people today are unlikely to know, which weren't unengaging. I'm not disagreeing with the premise, but I'm instead arguing that this lack of knowledge is in no way an apocalyptic era reconcilable problem. As a basic argument, those in society who work on infrastructure had better know how infrastructure works, and they often do. Those who don't, just don't. It would appear that almost no one knows this information. I had no idea. Why is that? Vaclav suggests that part of the reason we seem to have lost our gnosis is because we increasingly interact exclusively with black boxes. Take our phones, for example. We know perfectly well how to make a phone call, how to open an app, or just otherwise tap our finger to accomplish many different tasks. But what percentage of us actually have a real understanding of how this phone does what it does? 5% of us? 1% of us? Isn't that a bit concerning? Since a few decades ago, I can grant for the sake of argument that the proportion of people who don't know how devices work has increased. But even if we believe this is true, I don't think it's reasonable to characterize this increase as resulting in a degradation of the types of conversations we can have, or as dangerous. Even if people don't understand precisely how a phone works, they still know that a phone can connect them with people outside their state, county, province, dungeon, or country instantaneously, that phones often require cell data, or other basic facts that actually pertain to modern communication, the facts that actually play a role in conversation 
conversations around instant connectivity and distance human interaction. There could have been an argument here that knowing so little about the world leaves us vulnerable to governments or large companies controlling us. But even this, supported by actual data, could be disputed with a point about how much new and varied information this instant connective communication gives us access to, or something like that. This and related worries are wrapped up in interesting conversations that require context to make sense. Steve basically just pokes the idea that we're all dumb, doomed, silly, unaware nimrods while hiding behind the big, special, important theories pushed by these big, important people in these big, important books, without actually giving us data-backed reasons as to how unaware we actually are, and what this unawareness actually means. Instead, he hopes we'll draw the conclusion that we're dumb, doomed, silly, unaware nimrods first, and agree with the theory he's touting right after. Without modern world examples that show how not understanding the inner workings of a phone or not knowing what materials are used in agriculture is detrimental to our ability to live, everything he's saying just falls flat when we consider that the inner workings of our phone or the agricultural industry probably aren't that important to know if we're not literally repairing phones or driving tractors on a semi-weekly basis. There are just so many more man-made things in the world than there used to be, and so much more complex technology, that our brains would be much more stretched thin than they would have been in the past if we held them to this seemingly high knowledge standard. Maybe we would all be better off if more of us had a thorough understanding of all the black boxes we use, but we can acknowledge that without saying our lack of knowledge signals an upcoming doomsday. After peaking euphorically, you still slide down the same slippery slope. This second point could just be interpreted as an argument for making information more accessible, and still doesn't really point to or away from the so-called huge important impending crisis. Lastly, Steve says that key three is money, more specifically monetary control. In Ray Dalio's The Changing World Order, he explains, Dalio posits a theory similar to Strauss and Howe's Four Turnings, which claims that at the end of every 250 years, humanity completes a cycle in which power changes hands. In the past, it was the Dutch who had power, then it was the British, and now it's the US. Now, of course, just because we can find a pattern in the past, it does not mean that the future is necessarily bound to the same destiny. But what is particularly troubling, I think, is the economic circumstances under which these great struggles for power take place. Just like the first saculum thing, this point says that power will change hands soon, actually, I promise, oh my god. The world we live in is exactly the way it was before he said any of this, but Steve gives us a new perspective. Impending and drastic change in the underlying power structure, theorized to come whether we notice it or not. And perhaps the most glaring example today is the massive wealth disparity between the rich and the poor. This economic circumstance creates fertile ground for populist movements to gain traction and extreme leaders to take hold who promise to solve the problem. The major linking argument about crisis he makes here is that there's particularly high amount of wealth imbalance in society today, which seems to look like other times in the past when power, concentrated in more populist movements, has been transferred from one state actor to another. This is not to say that we don't actually have weird power-obsessed people trying to masquerade as populist right now, but this claim is nowhere near developed enough to actually support the idea that there's a crisis on the horizon. The closest we get to a substantive argument is the point about wealth imbalance, which is definitely true to a degree, but this point just cannot be analyzed meaningfully. We can point to wealth imbalance as imagined causation of crisis all we like, but the best we can find a reality is correlation, and correlation can't be applied to the future like this. Wealth imbalance can be a catalyst for crisis, sure, but it can also be a catalyst for drastic legislative change, for movements that push for political reform, for regulating how much billionaires receive or curbing body pillow price gouging. If we stare at correlation, even true correlation like this, and try to apply it to the future, we'll forget that we we are still people who have agency and can do things. We don't need to rifle through history books trying to gather clues as to what will happen to the future because we determine that future. If there's a high wealth imbalance right now, what if we set up conditions that reduce the disparity again? What if we do it all mostly right? These three theories, or keys, seem at first to support the broader implicit conclusion that something bad is externally inevitably happening to us, but end up falling flat when we realize the logic they're predicated on. Each of the three requires the viewer to first accept the idea that something bad is happening to us, and, given they accept it, provides a theoretical justification for embracing apocalyptic pessimism. The video itself reinforces dread by first validating it emotionally, then justifying it with vague philosophical theory. Meta-analytically, we get no contextual argument as to whether dread is a good thing to feel. I mean, should we want to feel dread? Should we willingly sit in our comfortable, cynical theory tower? My answer is no, and I think most of us would answer something similar. If we were asked whether we want to seek out pessimism and dread, I guess most of us would probably say no. But I think a lot of us naturally, instinctually, unintentionally seek out pessimism and dread, and don't don't realize it. I think a lot of people don't realize their tendency to search for and bask in dread and cynicism. To look for confirmation that chronic negativity is correct 
often justified, actually. Just because it's a feeling you're comfortable feeling doesn't mean it's healthy or justified or what you'd probably meta-analytically want as a goal in your life. Who would willingly say they're hoping to keep looking for and sticking to the pessimistic perspective forever? I mean, look at how this video's language implies passive acceptance of dread. Do I really have to remind you about the situation that we currently find ourselves in? For the question, what is happening to us? Which doesn't seem to be a constructive inquiry into the problem we have and how we might be able to solve it, but instead seems to imply that there's something external to all of us, some intangible force like key one, the saculum, or key three, the cycle, that inevitably causes all humans to create a crisis at the end of the terrible gay pride water slide that we're all shooting over inescapably. How can we escape the answer to what is happening to us when it presumes there's no solution? How can we experience anything but apathy if we believe this video when it implies that apathy is what most people feel, that there are reasons to feel it? If widespread apathy really does exist, I think portraying it as unavoidable only perpetuates the problem. Asking what is happening to us only ends up spreading the targeted apathetic conclusion. I don't think Steve meant to scare people with this video. It identifies a common feeling, a feeling that lots of modern people can't help but experience when a general trend of societal freedom sort of regresses for a few years. There's nothing sinister about feeling a little emptiness and wanting some comfort and knowing others feel it too. But I do think that this video needs to be exposed for its true effect. It implicitly mislabels all of us as passive participants in apathy. It tries to emotionally provoke the conclusion that the future of humanity is truly hopeless and that there's nothing you can do to save it. And I don't think Steve even truly believes what he's saying. Look at the sponsorship he took in this video, an art investment site. He does say, If you are considering, like I am, that the future ahead of us may look a lot different than our recent past, then it might make sense to look into alternative investment ideas. Take art, for example the type of art that costs six, seven, eight figures and hangs in a museum. This asset class has been a historically reliably positive performing class for quite some time now. But I don't think this is enough to hide the contradiction here. Obviously, investing in anything, whether that's art, stocks, or new business ideas, comes with some implicit level of faith in the idea that there will be future buyers, a future market, and a future society to hold that market. By taking this art investment website sponsorship deal, Steve reveals that he doesn't actually suspect a society ending crisis is really about to take place. At the end of the sponsorship, he says this. It's very very important to say that past results do not guarantee future returns, and this type of investment is more speculative than traditional asset classes. Steve then ends the video with, In many ways, the world is a better place than it was yesterday, just judging by objective measures. But I can't help shake the feeling that something is off, and perhaps terribly so. And therefore, I have to ask the question, does anyone else feel like everything has changed. The roll credits title itself. We conclude just as substanceless as we began. If Steve had wanted to be specific when speculating endlessly on the supposedly doomed future, he could have laid out and extrapolated from current data-backed trends. He could have gone through reasons the new generation will be unable to take care of itself or any other number of exercises in apathy, but he didn't. He chose to focus on theory over context, and the reason is pretty clear. The world is inherently more nuanced than the question, what is happening to us, allows. If Steve had said that something feels off and had given any data about the current world to support that idea, some amount more, maybe an eighth, a quarter, a third or so of his audience, who knows, would have disagreed, saying that current trends appear hopeful or that some data is ambiguous, or would have given some other combination of messy and unclear perspectives. By staying vague and playing on existential dread, Steve keeps his audiences removed from reality and as spiraling into apathy as possible. This helps no one at all. Like I said before, this type of argument is everywhere online. People love telling each other how depressed they are, how doomed they are, how doomed everything is, how doomed our systems are, how inevitable inevitable the crisis, the rapture, the asteroid, the sun expansion, the nuclear fallout already is, it all creates a culture of apathy, a culture that encourages thinking there's nothing anyone can do about any of our problems. We're feedback loops screaming at each other to stop moving, to stop resisting the so-called world-ending horrible tide of events and interactions and problems that we keep telling each other will doom us, when we could just face everything. The politics, the social events, the family disputes head on, link arms and climb out of the quicksand, talk to each other and brainstorm, test theories to find new solutions, new ways out of the mess, however bad, we now find ourselves in. I don't know why we're so naturally drawn to apathy, but one guess I have is that it's easier. It's easier to put each other down, to stay inside, to curl up into a ball, to sink into the sand, to hide behind scary and comforting thoughts that tell you everything's pointless, that not doing things is good. We use the idea that everything feels off to justify keeping ourselves isolated, telling ourselves to stop going out, stop interacting, stop taking action, content with the misery we leave ourselves in. We endlessly explain to ourselves why the abstract unknown exists and is scary, trying to justify seeking apathy instead of questioning the apathy we seek. The emptiness of that question from the video title should remind us that most of us, if we could choose, wouldn't want to be apathy seekers. We have to resist the temptation to fall back on comfortable anxiety, instead filling life with context, scary, messy, uncertain, and overcomable context. We have to stop looking for dread.